Welcome to a PEDRA publication presentation. This presentation is an overview of a peer-reviewed collaborative study and is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Any decisions related to medical care should be made in consultation with a qualified healthcare provider. This presentation, Care of Congenital Melanocytic Nevi in Newborns and Infants, Review and Management Recommendations, is brought to you by Dr. Marla Jenke. If you have questions or would like to give a publication presentation, please contact us at info at Hi. I'm Dr. Marla Jenke, and I'm a pediatric dermatologist at Henry Ford Health in Detroit, Michigan. Today, I'll be talking to you about a recent publication named The Care of Congenital Melanocytic Nevi in Newborns and Infants, Review and Management Recommendations. This publication was published in the Journal of Pediatrics in December 2021. The objectives of this publication were to provide pediatricians and other providers recommendations on the care of newborns and infants with congenital melanocytic nevi, or CMN. More specifically, we hope to provide recommendations on skin care and specialty management, surgery and procedures, and patient and family support. Why was this research needed? Well, no published guidelines exist for most aspects of care related to CMN, including routine skin care and visit intervals. There are few guidelines for surgical management. More broadly, we want to empower care providers to be able to prov provide superior care and be able to outline a plan for families when a newborn presents with a CMN, especially one that is cosmetically concerning or large or giant. We know that OBs sometimes have never delivered a baby with one of these more concerning CMN, or pediatricians may not be comfortable or aware of best practices, and we wanted to help guide this. How did we gather our information? Well, we were 11 researchers from the Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance, or PEDRA, who reviewed the literature for articles in English related to CMN from 1998 through July of 2020. Overall, the evidence that we found was generally low. We identified 1,144 articles, which included mostly reviews and case reports, but no randomized controlled trials. No articles address skin care related to babies with congenital nevi. There were several reports on surgical interventions, imaging, and melanoma risk. Our expert PEDRA working group developed recommendations based on the available evidence and consensus review. So let's take a step back. What are CMN? Congenital refers to present at birth or soon after. Melanocytic, meaning made of pigment producing cells called melanocytes. And nevus or nevi, when used in the plural, refers to birthmark. We often think of nevi as specific to melanocytic nevi or moles, but uh, as a pure definition, a nevus can refer to any type of birthmark. CMN affect less than 4% of newborns. What do they look like? Well, at birth, they can really have nearly any color, but they do usually darken with time. They can be raised or flat, various sizes or shapes, and babies can have one or more nevi. How do CMN develop? They're caused by a randomly occurring genetic change or mutation within the cells of the nevus. In small nevi, we usually see a BRAF mutation, whereas in large and giant nevi, we sometimes will see an NRAS mutation. These are not hereditary, meaning they are not passed from parents to children. They are a random event and not caused by anything that the parents did or did not do during pregnancy. How do they develop? Well, these, these melanocytes uh, 
cluster in various layers of the skin. So this is a cross section of the skin. So the epidermis being up at the top and then the dermis below. And what you're seeing here is these pigment cells are wrapping around various structures in the skin. So you can see even in uh, these cells can extend into the fat layer uh, or around things like hair follicles. Very rarely they can extend even deeper into the muscle. We often will classify CMN using the following um, classification system. Size referring is broken down into small, medium, large, giant, or multiple medium. Small being less than one and a half centimeter, medium being one and a half to 20 centimeters in size, large being 20 to 40 centimeters in size, and giant being greater than 40 centimeters. There's an additional classification called multiple medium, and this me means that there's three medium CMN without one largest CMN. As I talk about um, multiple CMN and satellite lesions as we go forward, this will hopefully make uh, sense. When we talk about size, we are referring to the projected adult size. And we have nomograms that we use to help us predict what that adult size will be. You'll see that there's some subcategories within medium, large, and giant, and these are generally used in a research setting. Satellites, or multiple CMN, refers to one larger CMN with smaller CMN scattered over the skin surface. This is different than multiplicity. Multiplicity refers to three or more medium CMN, and this is considered to be most significant as an association for melanoma and neurocutaneous melanosis. The classification schema also includes body site, color variation, rugosity, or the rigidity or uh, bumpiness within the nevus, nodularity, or lumps or bumps under the skin, hypertrichosis, or hair growth. What comorbidities are there with CMN? Well, we know that some patients do just do experience some discomfort, specifically itch, also known as pruritus, fragile skin, meaning breaking down of the skin where we'll see um, erosions or ulcers within the skin with minimal trauma, and some patients report abnormal sweating. Other things like melanoma, which is a form of skin cancer, or neurocutaneous melanosis, which I'll discuss in more detail in a, another few slides, also, the appearance can cause some issues with psychosocial development. The risk of melanoma is based on the nevus size. When we look at nevus of, nevi of any size, the risk is somewhere between 0.7 and 2.2%. The majority of the risk, however, is among giant nevi, where the risk can be somewhere between three and eight percent, based on depending on which study you read. Most cases of melanoma among high risk patients present in the central nervous system, as opposed to the skin. Neurocutaneous melanosis or melanocytosis refers to when melanocytes appear within the brain or other parts of the central nervous system in addition to the skin. The risk is variable. Some studies state that the risk can be up to 41% among the highest risk patients and that the risk of neurocutaneous melanocytosis correlates with the risk of melanoma. Both melanoma and neurocutaneous melanocytosis are more likely if a nevus is greater than 40 centimeters, if there are multiple CMN, the location is on the trunk, which may be a proxy for lesion size, 
or if there are multiple medium CMN, which is considered the highest risk for neurocutaneous melanocytosis. When we talk about multiple CMN, this is uh, when I was talking about the classification, this is multiple, uh, what we were, what I was referring to as multiplicity. Historically, what was used for this is when a patient has greater than 20 CMN outside of their main uh, larger nevus. All right, now that we've laid a bit more groundwork on the pathophysiology and comorbidities of CMN, let's discuss what recommendations were made within this paper. It appears that the skin overlying large and giant CMN have interruptions in barrier function. As I mentioned before, patients can experience itch and um, problems with wound healing. They can also have dry skin and rashes. While there was minimal information on CMN and skin care in any of the publications that we identified, I will discuss various elements of skin care that our group recommended here, many of which are extrapolated from the general skin care recommendations that we make, including in patients with other skin conditions that have that also present with barrier interruption. So what about bathing? Well, our authors recommended that patients bathe with water alone or with a non-soap cleanser at least two or three times per week. When we talk about a non-soap cleanser, we refer to a product that has a neutral or slightly acidic pH. We also recommend bland emollients immediately after bathing. More specifically, these would, would include creams or ointments that have minimal or no fragrance and preservatives. The goal of bathing then is to clean the skin without drying it out more and then just overall improve the skin barrier, the skin health, and decrease dryness. Dry skin and itch can be an issue. Patients may or may not even notice a rash in addition to these symptoms. We've recommended applying bland, thick emollients like creams or ointments with minimal or no fragrance or preservatives regularly. If patients experience symptoms, uh, then they can also add during a flare a low to mid-potency topical steroid twice a day. All right, what about skin fragility and wound healing? Especially in younger babies, we'll sometimes see that the skin will break down, causing erosions or ulcerations. It's important to be able to reassure parents that just because these erosions or ulcerations appear, <coughs> that this is not necessarily a concern for cancer or that someone's not handling the baby correctly. We strongly encourage caregivers to hold, hug, love their babies without fear that the baby will be harmed. So if any breakdown does occur, like bleeding or open skin, then we recommend that the caregivers clean these areas with soap or non-soap cleansers and water, apply petroleum jelly or bland ointments and a bandage, Consider a hydrocolloid or foam dressing, especially if there's discomfort, this can help with that. And if there's an area that's not healing in spite of good wound care, wound cultures for infection or biopsy uh, should be considered. And the reason we um, talk about a hydrocolloid dressing is that they protect the skin. And as I mentioned, they um, do help with discomfort but they also don't hurt the skin when they're removed like a typical Band-Aid can. All right, what about hypohydrosis or anhydrosis? So some patients will actually report decreased sweating in their CMN, especially if they're larger nevi. This is not a well-studied area. If patients are not sweating adequately, we need care to avoid overheating. So first is to counsel families that this can occur, and then to use cooling techniques if needed, like fans, um, and then obvious things like seeking shade and keeping them out of 
um, out of the sun and helping them cool down, frequent water breaks, mist, things like that. What about sun protection? There's no specific data on risks of UV radiation from the sun uh, with regard to CMN. Our recommendation was based on general um, good skin, uh, sun protection for all babies, including photo protection with clothing and hats and sunscreen. And then, of course, other things like staying out of the sun, um, seeking shade, uh, and only going out during times of less UV exposure, like mornings and evenings as opposed to midday. What about referring to dermatology and office visits? For small or medium CMN, referral is often not necessary, and the primary care provider, the pediatrician or family medicine doc, can manage these. If there's a concern, patients can be referred um, if there's something specific like color variation or strange nodules or symptoms or a cosmetically concerning location. Follow-up should be at well checks unless there's changes with the pediatrician. With large, giant, or multiple CMN, we recommend that all patients are referred to a NEVA specialist who's comfortable managing these. So it could be a general dermatologist or a pediatric dermatologist. Evaluation during an office visit may include things like inspection and should include a, a full skin exam, feeling or palpation of the nevus, lymph node palpation, photographs, and dermoscopy. Photographs and dermoscopy are not always performed, uh, but they are modalities that we have. Follow-up timing is very patient-specific, but in general, in newborns, they're seen every three months, and after one year of age, we will gradually see them less often. The visit frequency may increase with puberty or if there are any changes or concerns or if a patient is immune suppressed. The reason we follow early on, as well as during puberty, is to be able to help answer families' questions, but we also want to see the nevi when they are expected to have change normally, and also at times when melanoma and neurocutaneous mel melanocytosis are more concerning. Patients with immunosuppression may need to be seen more frequently due to an increased risk of melanoma. Enlarged lymph nodes are not necessarily a sign of melanoma. Physicians will use clinical context, imaging, and sometimes biopsy to differentiate non-cancerous or benign and malignant cancerous lymph node enlargement. This is important when we talk about parents following the nevi between visits. Um, we do encourage that families will look at the nevi, feel their, the, the child's nevus, and sometimes if they'll notice enlarged lymph nodes, for example, I, you know, I notice with my kids, sometimes I just am rubbing their neck and I can feel enlarged nevi, um, that some of these changes are expected and not necessarily uh, confirmation of something being terribly wrong. One special type of nevi are scalp nevi. They often will lighten over time. And even though it sometimes appears like a nevus is not even visible anymore, they still need to be followed by a specialist because the nevus cells are still there, even if the appearance is lighter. I really like this slide because it does show some of the changes that can be really significant. This is a newborn baby on the left, and you can see that there's quite a bit of color change and texture here, but by the time he's in late toddlerhood, you can see that the color has become much more uniform and the lesion is much smoother. We do sometimes see changes in growths with CMN. It's important to monitor between visits for families and to let us know if there's any concern. 
We recommend typically monthly evaluation at home so families can appreciate differences between visits. Families should notify physicians if there's any concerning changes, things like rapid, rapidly growing spots within, bleeding pain, new lumps, bumps, nodules, or any breakdown in the skin like ulceration. We hope uh, that patients will come see us in dermatology, but at the minimum to be evaluated by primary care. One specific change that we sometimes will see are proliferative nodules. These are non-cancerous benign growths that can mimic melanoma both in appearance and on a biopsy. New lumps and bumps do not always mean melanoma, and actually they usually aren't. Having a physician who has good judgment is key on the decision whether or not to biopsy. You have to have a really good dermatologist who has a really good dermo- dermatopathologist or the, the, uh, the pathologist who specializes in evaluation of skin biopsies because these can be really tough to interpret. We really encourage that a pathologist who reviews the biopsy has expertise in pigmented lesions in kids and has access to genetic studies when a diagnosis is unclear. Again, not every one of these will get a biopsy. In fact, we often won't. A physician will go by the feel, appearance, what changes occur over time, the size of the spot, the location of the spot. A biopsy sometimes helps us, but sometimes leaves us still confused. So this is an important spot, an important time when the family and the physician have to have tremendously good communication and understanding about what's going on. What about screening for neuromelanosis or melanocytosis and monitoring? We use MRI to screen babies who have no neurological symptoms. We use MRI to monitor concerns that are found on the screening MRI and also is a diagnostic tool if new symptoms appear. There are different protocols for the MRI depending on what type of imaging we're ordering depending on the indication. For screening, so this is babies who have no signs or symptoms, we recommend that we recommend against screening in small, medium, or large CMN because they are low risk for neurocutaneous melanocytosis unless the child has signs or symptoms like weakness or presumed pain. We do recommend screening MRI in patients with multiple medium CMN greater than 10 satellite lesions or multiplicity or giant CMN. These are, as I mentioned, higher risk for neurocutaneous melanocytosis. Additionally, children with neurological symptoms should undergo MRI to evaluate for neurocutaneous melanocytosis and other CNS abnormalities. Early screening consists of evaluation by MRI of the brain and spine without contrast and without anesthesia when possible. We believe, based on the available evidence, that this can provide useful clinical information and also help down the road if a patient were to develop symptoms so we have a baseline evaluation. In the perfect scenario, we use a feed and swaddle technique, so uh, no anesthesia is required. The baby is fed, made cozy, so that they hold still in the machine. And this can provide, as I mentioned, useful clinical information with low procedural risk. What about surgery and other procedures? So I'm actually going to read exactly how this was 
discussed because this is a very sensitive topic for, for many families um, and hard for us as pediatric dermatologists to discuss because it's very nuanced. So the decision for procedural interventions or removal of a CMN is complicated by nu numerous factors, including family preference, the size and location of the nevus, patient age, overall health, and prognosis if NCM or melanoma is present. Detailed risk and benefit discussions are required. So there are concerns with surgery, and we want families to be well-informed. Things like scarring, functional limitations, poor wound healing, and an inability to complete, completely remove a nevus are definite concerns, among others. And patients are too young to choose for themselves. We want families to have a good relationship with their surgeon and their dermatologist who's caring for their child to help them with this decision because it's often not an easy one for families to make. There are other procedures available like lasers, uh, curatage and germabrasion. Generally speaking, these may be associated with poor outcomes, including uh, obscuring our ability as dermatologists and families who are monitoring and other providers who are monitoring and helping in the future with evaluating for melanoma. And often one of the risks with this is that the pigment will come back even though it initially appears that the nevus is lighter. Hair removal is perfectly fine and there are many different techniques available. I would say beyond all of the science and all of the other guidance that we can give, having support available to families, especially in the early days, is so important. First of all is dermatologists, and I think I can speak for all physicians, pediatricians, family medicine doctors who may see our babies, that we are all here for the, our patients and the families. There are many resources available, and it can be tremendously helpful in the early days for these to be shared. There's a handout within the article, so I'll just put it up so that you can see how many resources are available, um, but I can assure you it, it should be easy to find um, within the article. It's one of the figures that we, we included. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, to provide this presentation. Please feel free to reach out if there are any questions, and please know that uh, pediatricians and dermatologists who may be serving rural communities and not have a pediatric dermatologist or Neva specialist families, we are all here uh, as Neva specialists to take care and help guide you. Uh, it's really one of the most rewarding aspects of what we do. Thank you very much.